Hello there, it's Antrice, and welcome to another episode of the Savvy Painter Podcast. One of the reasons that I love making this podcast for you every week is because I know what it's like to feel like you're not quite in the right place. I mean, people are nice and I love my friends, but I have a different connection with other artists. When artists get together, they light up. Normally shy or introverted people suddenly become animated and hard to shut up. That's how I know I've found my tribe. You know what I mean, right? It's like Helen Marr said in an iTunes review. When I found this, she says, it made a world of difference. Now I feel in touch again with artists. I have my peeps and they are here. First off, thank you so much, Helen Marr. And as I hope you've discovered from this podcast, you most definitely are not alone, even if it feels that way sometimes in your studio. Savvy Painter has been downloaded over a million times by artists in 150 countries. This is the place where you will find your community. You'll be inspired to push your paintings to the next level and discover how to confidently share your voice with the people who are waiting to hear it. And that's just from listening to the podcast. At least that's what people tell me. You can get even more when you join the Savvy Painter email list. When you sign up now, you get essential tips for artists, a free PDF filled with inspiring quotes and practical advice collected from years of Savvy Painter interviews. Go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash subscribe. It is that easy to join us. Adam Harrison is my guest today. Adam is originally from Colorado, and he now lives in Santa Monica. He teaches at Santa Monica City College and Cal State Long Beach. Adam paints large-scale landscapes and cityscapes on location. And when I say large, I'm talking four to six feet. Aside from the fact that his paintings are beautifully executed, what I love about Adam's work is his process and strategy. As he's painting, he's taking notes on the panels, and these scribbled notes stay there as part of his record. He goes back to the same location for months. And as an extra bonus, he usually ends up making friends in the process. Now, if anything about this description reminds you of Antonio Lopez Garcia, there might be a reason for that. In college, one of Adam's teachers, Rebecca Morales, had him watch El Sol de Membrillo, or Dream of Light, as it's translated in English. If you've never seen it, it's a two-hour film which documents Garcia's painting of a quince tree in his backyard. It is well worth your time and effort to get it. So in this episode, Adam talks about his very first attempt at painting a panel so large. He drove out to Dodger Stadium in Los Angeles, lugged all of his gear into Chavez Ravine, and learned a few key lessons about making such ambitious paintings on location. He has since become very strategic with how he incorporates his paintings into daily life, and he's developed three rules for selecting a location. Here's Adam Harrison to tell you all about it. Adam, thank you so much for being on the Savvy Painter podcast. I'm so excited to talk to you. Thank you so much, Entries, for having me on your show. I'm really honored to be part of it. I've been a fan for quite a while, and there's been a few heroes of mine on your show that, that I've, I've really enjoyed listening to them describe their process. So thank you for having me on. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. Can you tell me a little bit about when you first started out as an artist? What made you decide to make this your vocation? Yeah. That came early, I think. It wasn't any lightning moment for me. My dad was kind of into the arts, and I wanted to impress my dad as a youngster. Mm -hmm. So I remember just, you know, bugging him to see his drawings that he created in the Vietnam War. And and then he would be working on his drafting table, studying engineering when I was a child. And I was just so fascinated, and I wanted to impress him. So I'd always get him to like do projects with me. And I, I have a recollection of drawing like multiple <laughs> NFL helmets as a little person. <laughs> and that's that's kind of how it started. And I've certainly come into my own as far as an artist, but I still have that funny thing about impressing my dad. I I haven't shaken that yet. <laughs> I don't think that ever goes away. Probably still delighted if he puts it up on the refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's a high honor. That's a it high is. Honor. Oh, yeah. (laughs) It never goes away, though. There's so many. I mean, I think that's just part of you love to get, not you in particular, but people love getting the gold star or the pat on the shoulder from their parents. It's just those are our first role models and the first people that we really look up to. So it's kind of good, I think, when you still want to make them happy and impress them. 
I agree. Yeah. I mean, when you're, when you're so small, your world is also very small and your parents are giants, you know? So to see that and to, and also to just discover the joy in making art with him, that's just never gone away. Yeah. He used to be my largest collector, you know, (laughs) as all parents should be. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Yeah. I think my mom has a museum in, in our house of, of my work. So there you go. <laughs> that's wonderful. Yeah, that's wonderful. <laughs> who were some of the artists, other than your dad, who were some of the artists that you looked at when you were younger and that sort of inspired you to create? Yeah, when I was younger, I mean, I'm talking junior high, high school. They weren't anybody like, you know, spectacular. I mean, as far they weren't exotic. They were comic book artists, Disney animators, anybody that could draw a robot on fire really well, I liked. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, MC Escher comes to mind. You know, I, I wasn't really, I didn't get a good taste of art history at that age. But in college, while I was getting my bachelor's, I had a wonderful teacher. Her name was Rebecca Morales. And she made us sit down and watch this long, I think, two hour video of Antonio Lopez Garcia painting that Quincy tree in his backyard. And my world turned upside down. I thought that is so amazing. You can study something in your backyard and work with it for eons and enjoy the process. And to me, that's when, that's when things kind of lit in my brain and sort of got me going and thinking I could be an artist. So after watching that, what did you, did you go and try to do something similar where you were that focused and that into the subject? No, no. To be honest, I was more of a spectator. I I knew that to me, that was like the ideal for me personally, the ideal art making process. But I was terrified of the prospect of dragging a panel outside and working for months to a year or longer on one thing. So I played it safe in school and I made works that I'm really not proud of now, but I can see how they got me to where I am. For example, one of my one of my defaults, and this is maybe this could help some of your younger audience members. One of my defaults still today is to is to go when I feel inadequate in any way, or when I feel like I'm not up to par with my colleagues or back then my my schoolmates. My idea was to make work conceptual, to make work really important as the idea and and not so much about that physical makeup of the painting, the technique and so forth. And so I'd come up with these wild things. Like I did a whole series on people returning back to prison recidivism, which interested me, but not to the degree to invest, you know, my art career into. And I slowly lost grasp of why I wanted to be an artist in the first place. And so that really just kind of drugged me down And my remedy for that was to focus on the things in front of me. So when I was going to Laguna College of Art and Design, that's where I got my bachelor's degree, I started just painting the the chairs in my studio. And that was so helpful for me, so healthy, because I was not focused on the accomplishments of my schoolmates, which is another little thing I deal with, (laughs) is competition. I really get caught up with how people are doing around me. And Mm -hmm. that's such a negative influence on my own practice. So when I can let that go and just focus what's in front of me, it just flows more naturally. I'm much happier creatively. I'm happier with the results. And and then, you know, if, if I keep that up, then good things do come my way. I'm curious about that series you did on the prisoners. Was it on the prisoners or was it just on the idea of sort of that revolving door that happens? The idea, which as a, a young college student, you have so many different classes and so many different ideas and influences. And I was so interested, just as most people are, about these current things that are happening in our, our society with people going back to prison and relapsing. And, and it really stemmed from, I had to give a presentation at one of my, my classes. I think it was speech and acting or something like that. or No, it was critical thinking. So I had to give a speech. So I studied a lot and I, I became interested in it. And I thought, well, my paintings right now really stink. So I'm going to just start painting kind of bad paintings of people in jail, or I'll have all sorts of symbolic stuff going on with the idea of, of that revolving door where people just cannot get, break a cycle. Mm-hmm. And so that, that took me on a little path and 
Yeah, it's just it, it was not that helpful in the end. And what you were trying to do at that point was just come up with a concept that would carry the work rather than it sounds like the work itself. Maybe that was the path that you wandered down. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. It was. Yeah. It was it was a competitive I thought it was a competitive edge. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I've always that always comes back. So I have to be really careful of that. Yeah. I mean, I think it's really interesting that we do this, you know, that we think like, oh, okay, I'm not enough or my work is not enough. So I have to make it grander than what you eventually went back to, which is just or maybe not went back to, but just the observation and being okay with just painting a chair and that that that's enough. That's exactly right. Yeah, I don't know what it is about that desire to be successful at a young age is terrible, isn't it? I mean, yeah. it just dominates you. But yeah, so being able to just put that aside and sort of humbling yourself and saying, I'm just going to study what I know best. And that's been my motivation really from that point, from my early days in school, is just to study what I know best. And that has been the most rewarding process. Just gives so much back to you just to, to stay with something for a long period of time. And I don't think I, I'm not going to shake that. Yeah, I think it sounds so simple, right? Especially now when you're looking at back at that whole scenario in hindsight that, yeah, okay, I got a little competitive or I wanted to make my work feel more important somehow or, you know what I mean? Like, so I chose to do this conceptual piece of work that wasn't, it's not that that wasn't a good theme. It's just that it wasn't, it sounds like it wasn't chosen for the right reason. And then you eventually just settled in on the thing that fascinates you. That's right. And so that happened once when I was getting my bachelor's. And a second time that it cropped up was when I was getting my master's degree. Mm -hmm. So when I was back to school at Cal State Long Beach, I was starting to paint these rather ambitious figurative works that was really not my thing, loosely based on like Old Testament themes from the Bible. And again, I was just spinning my wheels and not making any progress or being satisfied whatsoever. And it started to it started to wear on me, both physically, I was becoming really stressed, and emotionally, I was just tired of painting. I didn't want to pursue that path anymore. So at that point, this is going back to that same idea of just focusing on what's in front of you. I just dropped everything. I told my committee at the time that I'm going to go to Spain, and I'm going to spend... 10 days at Antonio Lopez's retrospective show in Madrid and just see what this guy that I've always admired, what he did with the subjects he knew best. So that's what I did. I, I went to Madrid. I, I went back and back and back to that museum, to that re retrospective show. And I, I said, this is what I'm, this is what I have to do to be satisfied as an artist, to make things that I, that I'm going to be proud of that may, you know, end up in my dad's house. That'd be nice. <laughs> To be happy, to be really happy. So at that point, I came back after seeing that show, that l wonderful, wonderful show, and I just started. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get out there and I'm gonna just start painting things in my city, my environment. You know, with all of the bumbles and with all the terrible preparation I took, and all of the, <laughs> you know, all of the big questions and oh my goodness, entries. I, I had so much to learn. You know that. <laughs> The transition from studio to working outdoors was a huge learning curve. I'm still, I'm still learning a lot right now, but it's really gratifying. I love this so much. Okay. So you went from being first when you saw that, I know that movie well, it's so good. I'll post, I think you can still grab the whole thing on YouTube if they haven't yeah. pulled it down yet. I think you can still get it. So if it's there, I'll post it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Please do. Please do. I, your audience will will just eat it up. They'll love it. It's so, yeah, it's so good. And it's so absolutely fascinating. And it's the slowest paced. I mean, it it is it is kind of like watching paint dry, but it's, <laughs> it's completely mesmerizing, like watching him work. You're just like, oh my gosh. So- you watched that and you were thinking to yourself, oh, I can't paint outside. You know, that's too much. Can you tell me like, okay, after you go to Madrid, you spend 10 days with his work, you come back knowing this is, this is what I'm going to do. Tell me about the first time you actually went outside to paint. What did you take with you? What did you forget? Oh my goodness. 
Okay. I want to hear the story. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Well, it was a horrific process in the beginning because here I am as a grad student, not much money. I had these very large panels, four by four foot panels made out of quarter inch birchwood plywood with stretcher bars on the back. So they weighed like 50 pounds a piece. (laughs) That may be an exaggeration, but they were heavy. They were heavy and (laughs) well-built. Over-engineered. Like, what am I doing? So yeah, I built these things. I decided on making a diptych Dodger Stadium. It's a four by eight foot painting now that could be 80 to 100 pounds. I brought my studio wooden single mast easel, which was not light. (laughs) I brought a lawn chair, my glass palette, three nondescript large bags, probably Trader Joe's grocery bags full of stuff. Just what I I didn't know. Right. Like I just grabbed my studio basically and shoved it into (laughs) these bags, everything. I had no idea. And so I grabbed all this stuff, uh, forgetting things like uh, sunscreen, Mm. things that will protect me from the environment, all this stuff. I proceeded to drive in my little Subaru Forester around the stadium, which is like a fortress, you know, this is in Chavez Ravine here in Los Angeles. And it is, you can't get in. So you're driving around trying to find any kind of angle whatsoever. And I finally located this spot above the stadium. There's a, it's called Elysian Park and it kind of wraps around like the out. And I found this spot, but I had to go down this fire road about 50 yards worth. And then I had to bushwhack like another 25 yards through this like really soft decomposing soil that you just sink into. So imagine me with all of these bags and my easel, two very large panels, my glass palette, my paint, my everything, <laughs> all everything except Several the sunscreen. Several trips, except the sunscreen, yes. Several trips. Yeah. I mean, this is really a young man's project, you know? Right. I know that area well. My mom actually taught for decades at a school right in that neighborhood And so I also know that in that, there's some pretty shady places around Dodger Stadium. There are, there are. And I I do have a couple stories too about meeting some undesirable or getting some undesirable attention Uh there. If I, that sounds pretty polite, doesn't it? It sounds very polite. Yeah. But I've, I've been there and I've painted there and I've gotten the same, probably very similar attention or people annoyed at me because I was in interrupting something that they were going to do. <laughs> yeah, their their sphere, their world, yes. you know, and like here's this artist. I mean, we already look like aliens to these people, you know, right. to most people. Right. So, yeah, there are some there were some characters up there. I'm actually back there now. I just started another painting. I don't know why, but I'm smarter now. So, <laughs> I kind of keep to my own. I grew some facial hair, wear a Dodgers hat, you know, I kind of look like <laughs> uh, maybe I shouldn't mess with this guy. But yeah, anyway, so I found this this spot and I just I just planted myself out there on this hilltop, totally exposed to the environment, <laughs> uh, exposed to the certain individuals that like to be up there. And I just started in entries. I really had no idea. I mean, watching that video of Antonio working on that tree really is not <laughs> much help. I mean, you, it's not like, oh, yeah. I totally get it, you know, right. and there was really no preparation for this at all. And it, it also doesn't help that he has decades of experience doing exactly that thing by the <laughs> time and you're watching it going, I could do that. I could. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know. It never dawns on you. You just think, oh, yeah, he just picked up all this. He just worked like this automatically. So uh-huh. he, I, I should be able to do it, too. But that process that that was in school. And that's on my website because I'm still kind of happy with the results. But I could get there about, I don't know, three times a week. That process took two years to finish because it was so much learning, so much reconstruction, so much tearing down, building up, trying to learn how to measure. I had rulers taped to my panels and I was dividing it. And I mean, it was ridiculous. I had no idea what I was up to. But I finally, at the end, started to get an inkling of an idea of how to make what I want to make. And I was pretty happy with the result. You know, I mean, it's an early painting and it's kind of crude, but yeah, I was, I was satisfied. And you said it took you a couple of years to finish it. Yeah. So that one, that one takes a cake as far as time. Although I've had other paintings up to a year and a half. I ranged from six to 12 months for one painting, but that one took forever. Okay. So this is the first time you've done this 
type of work. Can I, is that a good way to put it? I don't know. Yeah. So this is the first time you've, you know, you've lugged out. The, it's a really ambitious thing that you were attempt that you did that not that you were attempted that you did. And you've got these four foot canvases and all of these. <laughs> just, I can just, I can totally picture it and I'm laughing because I've done the same thing. <laughs> and you're there painting it on site and it's taking you several years. Did you ever get frustrated and go, you know what? <laughs> this actually kind of sucks. Yeah. No, I constantly, I, and I struggle with that today. I will make something, I will be working on something forever. I mean, behind me here in the studio, I have stacks of stuff that I, who knows when they'll be finished. And generally I'm not impressed with, <laughs> with ages they are, you know, like I enjoy making them. I really get into it. But when I look at it, when I try to separate myself from the process and I look at it objectively, I, I'm not always too thrilled with them, you know, and I'm a little timid about showing them, you know, I really hate showing them online. I hate pictures of my work online. I just think they look terrible. You think they don't translate well as a photo, you mean? I don't. And I was having this conversation with a friend the other night, and he was he was saying, some artists work look fantastic online, where in life, it doesn't translate. And I was like, yeah, I'm the opposite completely. I think, in my personal opinion, when you work on something for a long period of time, there's a sense of history. Uh -huh. And you see a lot of the, the recording and the mistakes. Mm-hmm especially with me, because I use a lot of pencil to make notes and, and registration marks. And so there's a lot of stuff going on that you can't see on a little tiny, you know, two by three image on your screen. So for me, I, I like seeing them finished in person, but on, online, I'm not a fan. So I'm going to keep going back to that first painting for a little bit, but what yeah. I'm just imagining for, you know, as long as it took you to do that, you're dragging these canvases out there it had to have been really frustrating, like you said. And what made you keep going on that painting and not just go, you know what? No. Or I'm going to do a different one or, you know, just drop that one. Well, I wish I could say it's like this internal passion, this fire within. It's not really that. It's having someone waiting for it has been my greatest success. <laughs> the greatest secret to my success, rather. It is having a deadline or the anticipation of it being finished, or someone watching the progress. That has really propelled each and every project of mine from start to finish. That has gotten me into galleries and publications. And you know that's, that's gotten me to where I am now is because people are waiting. And it started out a, a really small, you know, like my committee at Cal State Long Beach, they were waiting for it. And then I finished school. And then George Billis, my gallery, they were waiting for something for a group show. And then the same gallery is waiting for something for a solo show. And, and that's helped me finish work because one, another little fault, I feel like I'm in therapy right now, but another <laughs> little fault of mine, I guess you're easy to talk to. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm just laughing. I don't, I don't want to like push you to, to say things you don't want to say, but I don't know. I mean, you can stop me anytime because okay. I'll just keep going. Yeah. <laughs> In fact, I kind of lost my train of thought, but... You were just about to reveal your deepest, darkest secret, too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Stop the tape. Okay. <laughs> so having someone wait for my work is really helpful for me. When I make work, I enjoy it immensely. I like the process a lot. But one of my defaults is to give up or have that feeling of stopping and so I'll start something up again. And that's just kind of a natural thing for me to like, I've taken it really far, but, but I'm not really into it right now. So I'll do something else. So having those people say, well, what about that something before that something else? Where is it? Mm -hmm. I'll be like, oh yeah, I'll go back out. And then I find that joy again. I find that, that energy that I, that I, I once had when I began, you know, so having someone wait for me, I guess, is the, is the secret. You know, I just, I heard this talk of this researcher, you know, you know all these researchers, they always want to put people in groups. Okay. <laughs> right? Yeah, right. <laughs> like, you know, there are four types of people. There are three types of people. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Which is what she was, she was basically coming up with. But I thought it was really interesting how she categorized it was some people, it's kind of like being a people pleaser in the sense that you will not disappoint other people. You might break promises to yourself, but you will not 
break promises to other people or disappoint them in some way. And then there's people who are, I'm paraphrasing this and probably paraphrasing it horribly, but there's that type of person that the reason that they finish things or or their their incentive is external. Mm -hmm. And then there's people who it's all about the promises that they make to themselves And then there's a questioner, somebody who you have to tell them exactly why it needs to be done in order for them to do it. They have to understand everything before they'll do it. Right. And then the final one is the rebel. The rebel. The rebel is kind of like, you you can't tell me what to do. (laughs) Right. And so they're more about being a rebel, about kind of reverse psychology works very well on those people. Uh Uh-huh. But the obliger which is the one that it sounds like you respond to. And I do also is the most common. Oh, that's good. By the way. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> Just so you don't feel like you're a little bit off or weird or anything. <laughs> it is by far the most common that people are more likely to not keep promises to themselves, but they will hold up their word to other people. And so the way that you, you know, when you feel like you're not If there's something you really want to do and you're afraid you're going to fall back on it, then for an obliger, the thing to do is to basically announce it to somebody else who's going to hold you accountable. So in your case, like show it to your gallery or show it to the person who's going to be asking you about it later, that person that's going to be waiting for you. So whether it's on purpose or not, you've found the perfect way to, (laughs) if she's right, you found the perfect way to motivate yourself and get the work done based on your personality type. This is turning into a fit therapy. This session is. <laughs> it is. It's wonderful, and uh, I feel like I should I, send me the bill. When you're done. <laughs> this is one really helpful for me. So I'm obliger. Yeah, I think that's true. I think I'm obliger with a dash of rebellion too, because uh-huh. I, I kind of have sort of bucked. I don't know if that's the right way to say it, but I, I've sort of not gone with the trend in, in most decision making and as far as art making. But I am, I am compelled to finish things because people are waiting for it. So yeah, the obliger, this, that makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. A lot. Yeah. And I absolutely, like when, when I was listening to her, she wrote a book on it. It's Gretchen Rubin. She wrote, she's most famous for this book called The Happiness Project, which I will admit I've never read in its entirety. Okay. But this latest one, I, I heard her speak in an event. And so she kind of went through it all. And I was like, huh. That's interesting. And I can, and I'm a total obliger. I can see it. Now, I, the only thing I want to say is that as far as that's the motivation to finish something, it's mm-hmm. not the, it's not the initiator Mm-mm. that, that comes from that, maybe that rebellious side, that rebellion or that, that impulse, you know, which mm-hmm. is very fleeting of course, but there's something that puts me into drive. And then it is the person waiting for it that allows me to, to continue through the process until I see it all the way through, which is this trying because if you're working on something for six months to 24 months, it's like, when is this thing going to be off of my living room floor? You know, like, when am I going to be done with it? Mm-hmm. So uh, yeah, the, the motivator is not always what the initiator is, you know? Right. So since that first painting that you did over at Dodger Stadium, what have you learned about doing large scale paintings outdoors? Well, first to bring the proper clothing and sun protection. And sunscreen. <laughs> yeah. And how bad was your sunburn after that? <laughs> I probably aged a couple of years, I think. You know, I think my, <laughs> I don't know. I, I definitely did get burned. There's a funny picture of me on my website. Of, I'm all out there and I, and I look like, I look terrible, I think. Yeah, but no. So th- to answer your question more specifically, certain things that I've learned is how to bring the necessities very easily. So making my studio mobile, making my location sites practical, Mm -hmm. easy to get to, (laughs) that includes access to bathrooms. That's a big one. Yes. Yeah. (laughs) I've discovered that the hard way. Access to food, if you don't bring your own, ease of parking, Mm -hmm. comfortable environments as far as people are there, because sometimes like Dodger Stadium, it's not always that welcoming. So you learn, you you slowly do kind of develop a way of preparing that enables you to make these kind of paintings. So that's, that's a big thing is just getting my studio out there and learning where to be. 
I hope I'm not just drawing on here, but I'll just continue if you don't mind. Yeah, go ahead. I will interrupt you. Don't worry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. That's what I need. I, I need that. I wish my students did that more often. <laughs> the other things that I've learned is patience. I've learned that the development of a painting is not going to be visually amazing off the bat and to find things that that excites you throughout the process. So for me, I'm really meticulous with measurements. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they come in the very beginning of a painting. Sometimes they come through the, the middle process of the painting. But I get really, really specific with measurements and, and relationships between things. So that, to me, that's probably a little bit of my, my dad's engineering coming through. Mm -hmm. But I, I really enjoy that. So even if I'm looking at my painting and I'm not happy with where it is visually, I can still get out there and find stuff that I'm into. Color relationships, building up, like if I feel like everything's just going terrible, I'll work on one little small thing in the painting and get me excited about other things in the painting. So that, that gets me out of a funk. So that's, that's something that I've learned since my Dodger days. <laughs> Can you describe the the process of doing that? I'm so curious about this because I do some I do painting outdoors, but not that big. So I'm so curious about do you have to tie it down? Do you I mean just the small canvases I use, I sometimes am fighting against the wind and is this thing going to blow over and all this stuff. So you're basically you've got this giant sail out there that you're working on. I, and I've described it the same way to people. It really takes the wind. And, you know, and I've been caught off guard a few times where it's knocked me out, not out, but knocked me around. Wow. Yeah, I, I started a painting when I was, I lived in Downey, Downey, California for four years. And I started a painting in this riverbed. It was a dried riverbed. Mm -hmm. And the wind was, it would kick up like effectively. And yeah, so I've learned that lesson that this large painting can hurt you if you're not careful. So yeah, so the process for just even setting up has been well planned out. First, I still kind of have a heavy easel. That That's kind of a necessity. Mm -hmm. The second, I love any kind of steak, like a tent steak, a bicycle rack, you know, those, those hooks that you put in your garage, mm -hmm. anything like that. And I will rig up my painting and easel and I'll tie it down to anything or plant it into the earth or whatever. So it, it often looks like sailboat rigging, you know, mm -hmm. and sometimes I, I have to tie off like little pieces of red cloth because people walk into it. So I have to be careful about that. Oh, yeah. OK. Because I, I don't work all the time isolated. I'm in the city quite a bit, you know, so I have to be careful about what I'm my surroundings and the people that are around me. So yeah, I have to take care of the, the easel and the painting so it doesn't go flying off. I have to take care of leveling the painting. So I use an angle finder to help me make sure it's level all the time. I have to draw or paint. This is my only graffiti, but I paint my feet outline usually on, on sidewalks. So all over Santa Monica, for example, there's like little footprints of me. <laughs> or worse, I have to put those tent stakes into the ground hoping that some little kid doesn't find him or that the crabgrass doesn't grow over. Both have happened, by the way, and it's miserable. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so those are some things I have to do just to make sure I'm in the right spot and, and things won't fly off, you know? Right. So you leave your tent stakes there when you go home and come back. Yeah. And crabgrass really is terrible. It, it is. It will hide. Yeah. In, in days, in days, it'll be like, where, where am I? And you'll be on your hands and knees for like a half hour. Like, I, I swear I was right here. I'm not <laughs> sure. Maybe I was over here. <laughs> you need to get one of those beachcomber yeah. things so that it beeps at you <laughs> you can find it again. That's a great idea. And maybe pick up an old Rolex or something too. Well, not there. there you go. <laughs> get some spare change while you're working. <laughs> yeah. It's always fun to paint in the wild, paint in the city, and you get lots of people, lots of very curious people. What are some of the more me memorable responses you've had while you're out there working? Oh, well, it's exactly, it comes from those kind of scenarios where it's just the general public. And when they come and interact with you, that's a reward in itself most of the time. Mm-hmm. I have to just, for your listeners, I have to say that headphones is a great deterrent, as you know, mm -hmm. if you're not looking for extra attention. So headphones are a great deterrent. But beyond that, just general interaction with the public is very rewarding. 
And some of my more memorable times has been talking to people whose environment I'm painting and they will see it in a totally different way. That's something I find really interesting is when you paint something so familiar to somebody and it looks completely different in a really exciting, fresh way. And when they, when they experience that and they light up, it is just, they just throw fuel on the fire for me. It is just <laughs> awesome. I enjoy that so much, you know, sharing that with these people. Yeah. Yeah. It's really fun when, yeah, when you get, I'd say 90% of the time, the people that walk up are just wonderful and they're, you know, like they're genuinely curious and it's sort of exciting not so, I mean, for them, it's really exciting to meet a quote unquote real artist, you know, <laughs> and it's a big deal for them. And it absolutely throws fuel on the fire. And it's sort of, for me, at least it reminds me of one of the, I don't know, one of the most beautiful reasons that we paint, you know, is, is that, right. is that interaction that sharing it with people and showing them something that they see every day, but they've never seen. Right. I mean, it, it's really no different from like, walking into a familiar place, like going to a park near by your house. And, and there's a musician there just playing the guitar. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden that, that environment that, you know, so well transforms into like kind of a magical experience, you know, and I think art can do that too with people and not only just kind of like give them a new, a new angle or a new perspective on, on something they know so well, but I've also really enjoyed people connecting creatively because I'll, I'll often get stories about things that they've created or people in their family who are artists or, you know, some sort of connection to a visual art in their, in their history. And that's fun too, because that's something that we, I think, I think too many people deny themselves is that creative process of making something visual. Yeah. Yeah. There's something, you know, and we, I think sometimes take it for granted as artists, I think, because, I don't know, because we take it so seriously, because we put so much of ourselves into it that we forget that this is actually supposed to be fun, too. You know? Yeah, I know. And I don't want to discourage people by that whole thing about the motivation is to, to do it for somebody else, because it's not. I do it for myself, of course, you know. Yeah, no, that's just like, I don't know. It's it's deadlines are important. I need deadlines, too. So, and so we're kind of talking the same language, I guess, that if I don't have a deadline, it will take me years to do a painting that does not need years to create, you know? <laughs> Isn't that the funniest thing? I know exactly what you're talking about. It's like I, the, I got a several of those just lying around. I'll never finish them. Yeah. They'll, I mean, Probably. pull them out and work on them every now and again, and then put them away. And then, you know, if there's no, so I have to put self-imposed deadlines on myself, or I have to like kind of announce to my husband or my family or whatever, that this will be done this week, <laughs> you know, somebody, <laughs> somebody that I know is going to say, Hey, so did you finish it? <laughs> yeah. You're held accountable, right? By yeah. People you love. Yeah. It's important. Perfect. It's like that. I think we all need that to, to some extent. So yep. it's not about, you know, painting for other people. It's just, it's about finishing the painting. Which is, I mean, that's, to be honest, that's like just such a great feeling, isn't it? To be finished. Yeah. To say, I'm moving on because I I finished this particular piece. That's a great feeling. Yeah. I've said what I wanted to say. It's done. Like, I got it out and it's what I wanted. That's an amazing feeling. By no means is it easy in any part of the process, you know. Once you start laying down paint on canvas, it's like uphill yeah. from there on, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Most of the time. <laughs> but the other thing too, and it sounds like you have the same experience is that I just, I love the process of it. And maybe that's why I need that external, like, Hey, are you done? Because I just get lost in the doing of it <laughs> and like getting really excited about, you know, whatever it is, like for you, you were talking about the measurements and just the act of creating it is what I like and the end right. product. I it's not, it's so hard to articulate. Cause it sounds like if I say, I don't really care. It sounds like I don't care about my own painting. I do care, but the actual experience of creating it, the process of doing it is like 30,000 times more fulfilling for me than the final product. 
Yeah, I, I hope that point wasn't lost in all my motivation talk because making the work is is a reward in itself. You know, that's really fun. So I, I completely get what you're talking about. Yeah. And I don't think I don't think anyone can create paintings like you create without loving the process. Because that's right. you're talking like a year of torture otherwise, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just Learn how to be an accountant or something. (laughs) Yeah. So we've been talking about the process and how you create it, but I would love to hear like, how do you choose your motif? How do you choose what you're going to paint? What is it that excites you and makes you kind of throw on the brakes and say, I'm putting the stakes in the ground right here? Right. I get this question quite a bit, actually. I have three have tos in my, in my work, three criteria to start a painting. The very first one is a sense of wonder or wow, like that something that just blows you away initially, like that is incredible. I love looking at whatever that might be. That's the first criteria. The second criteria would be, does this image resonate with me? Do I continue to think about it throughout the days and weeks and months? Because typically when I, when I see something that I really like to paint, I don't get around to painting it now for, you know, six months to a year or longer because I have so uh, so many other commitments. Mm. So if it just keeps sitting around, if I keep, you know, it keeps kind of just going on and on in my brain, like, oh, yeah, I really did like that. I wonder how I could paint that. I wonder, you know, and you start trying to visualize yourself out there doing it. That's really important. So that's my second criteria. The third criteria is how practical is it to get there? on a weekly basis or maybe even daily. Is there parking? Is it close to home? Is it close to work maybe? Is it close to a friend's house? Is there some other reason why I would be in that area rather than the painting? And if so, does it offer things like I discussed, parking, is there bathrooms? Is there, is it safe? Yeah. You know, that's important here in Los Angeles. Like, am I going to go out in the middle of the night to who knows, East LA? You know, probably not. Mm. So, I'm thinking like, how can I actually do it? Is it reasonable to even start the project? Yeah. Yeah. So those three things, that's that's how I start a painting. That third one, though, is really smart. It's very strategic because you sort of build, you know, you're stacking the deck in your favor and building it, it in that idea of, is it accessible in the sense that yeah. Is it by a friend's house? So at least I can, you know, I can kind of, (laughs) I know I'm going to be going there or there's more of an incentive on those days when I need to, when I need extra incentive, I can stop by my friend's house afterwards or, you know, like all these built-in things. That's really, really smart. And I don't hear that very often. Yeah. And you know what happens? uh, Like, so if, if, if it's not like a friend's house or something, what ends up happening is you end up having a friend with a friend's <laughs> house in that area. You know, I've made a lot of friends just painting, just working for, you know, they just see this guy out there for a year. You end up talking and then they make you some kind of, you know, some cool dinner. And then all of a sudden you're friends with them and you have a place to hang out. So that's been really cool, really rewarding. That is. That's so awesome. Especially yeah. from, you know, what we talked about a few minutes ago about showing people their own world in a different way. Yeah. it's rewarding on both sides, really. Yeah. So can you tell me, I'm always interested in both things that you feel like you're, you've done really well that have sort of contributed to your success. And I think we've sort of touched on a few of those, but do you have any habits or rituals that you feel like contribute to your growth or your success as an artist? It is just going out every day. Mm -hmm. It is just having projects in grad school, I hope this isn't too long of an answer to your question, but in grad school, I started to paint multiple paintings at once. So I, I would have a painting on a Monday, I had a painting on a Tuesday, a painting on a Wednesday. Wherever I was, I'd have a painting there. And so I've I've kept that going. Wait, so you, do you mean you had basically five or seven different paintings going and every day you would you would kind of switch locations? Right. So seven, it was seven paintings through grad school and that number changes here and there now, but yeah, so it's, it's five to seven paintings generally. So like I was talking about that criteria of work, of making work, one of them is practicality. So I have a painting for wherever I am throughout the work week. Uh-huh. I teach in Long Beach at Cal State. I teach at Santa Monica College all over the place. So I'll have a painting usually at those locations plus home 
And then I kind of have my little fun project. So my new fun project is on Saturday mornings at Dodger Stadium, which <laughs> th- thank goodness the gas mileage is tax. You know, it's a tax write off, but that's kind of breaking my my number three rule right there. Right. Wait. So where do you live now? Do you live in Santa Monica or Long Beach? Or <laughs> my wife and I are in Santa Monica. And, um, you know, as an adjunct professor, you're driving everywhere. So I, I work in Long Beach a couple of days a week and I'm here for the rest of the week, but I'll go different places that that's part of my routine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Santa Monica to Dodger Stadium, that is a haul. Yeah. It turns out to be about you know, 20 miles each way, which I guess doesn't seem like a lot, but on the 110, you know, one mile is a thousand. Yeah. In Los Angeles, that's like... <laughs> Everything, theoretically, everything in Los Angeles is 20 minutes away if there's no traffic. Right. It's so, like, the roads were built beautifully for people driving in the 50s. You know, that yes. works wonderful, I'm sure. Right. But there's always traffic. So it could be 20 minutes or it could be three hours. You just never know. Yeah. it's That's, that's our world, isn't it? <laughs> okay. So sorry, I totally interrupted. I did need that coffee or maybe I shouldn't. I don't know, but I'm getting really chatty. I feel like I'm getting really <laughs> chatty all of a sudden. Where I'm like, wait, so what about this? Oh, what about this? <laughs> yeah, no, no, I don't think I'm answering your questions so, thoroughly. So I'm like, <laughs> listening you to talk. And well, and I'm also interrupting you with kind of tangents. Okay, so you were talking about this habit you have and these sometimes seven days a week of switching your location as part of your strategy. Yeah, that's part of my strategy. So wherever I am throughout the week, if it's work related, if it's whatever, I will have a typically I will have a painting location there. So it just makes it easy. Yeah. So like right now, I'm continuing. I'm working at Cal State Long Beach and I'm continuing a painting of the power plant down there by the 605 because I'm there. Uh It's kind of crazy because I teach a night class there, start at seven, I end around 10 o'clock, but I'm there around 11 o'clock in the morning working on a painting. And it's a great motivator because I'm like, I miss traffic. I'm doing something that I like and I'm just doing something I like. So yeah, it's great. That makes a lot of sense. That's awesome. And so that's your habit that you feel like really helps is just showing up and having these systems in place effectively to make it easier for you to work and make it easier for you to be consistent. Sounds like. Yeah. If you don't work in the studio, you you have to come up with some kind of some, some sort of basic game plan. So since I work just from life, I have to be there in life. You know, I, yeah. I have to make that work. If I had it my way, if I had just trillions of dollars, I would just probably not work and go to amazing places. But this is the world and this is what I'm responding to. It's an excellent strategy. It's very simple. And I've just never, maybe never asked it the same way. But I don't think I've ever talked to anybody who who approaches it that way. And it's brilliant in its simplicity. That's what I love about it. <laughs> it's kind of like one of those things when you hear it, you're like, duh, that makes that's so obvious. And it makes so much sense. <laughs> it, but so, the simple things, I mean, that didn't just happen either. It was because there was a a frustration of work not happening fast enough, or I felt like I was, I was just wasn't producing. So that was just through trial and error just started to do that. Yeah. And it it turned out to be a pretty good system for me and I'm doing it now, doing it still. Yeah. It makes total sense. And I'm sure there's, I mean, there's so many people, so many artists who, who have that same frustration that, yeah, we all wish that we didn't have to do other things to make money. You know, it could just, just paint. <laughs> so anything, anything that we can do to sort of grease the wheels and make it simpler, easier, and more obtainable, that totally works. Yeah. Have you ever experienced a point in your, your career that you were really struggling with something? And if so, would you mind describing that and how you worked through it? Yeah. Can I describe a setback that happened prior to art school? not in my professional career. Yeah. So as a young person in high school, I didn't have much prospects. Our family didn't have a lot of money and I didn't really see myself being a working artist. So my thought was I'll just join the military. So I signed up for the Marines and I was all set to do that. And then I got in a car accident the night before my physical And then I was totally disqualified 
from any armed services. And that was such a blow to me because I, I didn't have art. At least I thought I didn't have art. And I didn't have this career path, this one way out of Louisville, Colorado. And that was a, a really trying time as a younger person, you know, 18 years old. But as a result of that, I was able to get a little bit of money from an auto insurance company. And I was able to go to art school and my world opened up. So what started off as like when you're 18, the world is very small. And I thought mine had ended, you know, yeah, essentially. And when I kind of got out of that funk and it took a while, you know, with the rehab and everything. But once I got out of that, I realized, hey, I have a, I have a new opportunity to do something I thought wouldn't be possible. So that opened up a, a whole new life. And it was really it's been a, it's been a great ride. <laughs> That is an awesome story to end this on, even though like, I think I probably have like 20 million more questions for you. <laughs> <laughs> I know that wasn't a very specific answer to your, your question, but that one stands out, you know, for me. Well, it's a, it's a huge one. And I can just imagine how that felt at the time, because you're, especially when you're, you know, when you're 18 and you feel like you have everything figured out and you so desperately want to do this thing to move yourself forward. And that's the path that you see. And then all of a sudden it's taken away from you. That's devastating. You can look back at, on it now and go like, okay, you know, every, that was the best thing that ever happened maybe. Right. Right. But at the time you had no idea. No idea. And your experiences as an 18 year old are so limited anyway, that something like a, a car accident where your, your whole future is shifted, essentially closed. It is, it's, it's just like the end of your world. It, it, and I remember struggling with that for a long time because I had, well, I was pretty busted up and just to be able to walk and do stuff again normally took months and months. And it was, it was debilitating, not just physically, but emotionally, mm -hmm. but art came to the rescue. Yay. Wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it has an amazing ability to do that. An amazing ability. Yeah. Adam, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk with you. Thank you so much. Entries, thank you so much for having me on. I've enjoyed this. I was initially a little bit nervous, to be honest with you, but I have had a lot of fun. Good. And I hope I didn't bore you too much, but... Not at all. Okay. Not even, all right. not at all. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you for the therapy lesson. <laughs> That's I, right. That's right. I'm going to send you a bill now, right? I'll send you a book instead. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> okay, accepted. That's easy. <laughs> Thank you very much. Many thanks to Adam Harrison for sharing his story with us. You can see Adam's painting and get links to everything that we talked about at SavvyPainter.com forward slash podcast. If you know another artist who would benefit from some of the things that Adam shared with us today, do me a favor and please share this episode with them. One more thing I want to let you know, this year you can expect a lot more workshops from Savvy Painter. If you are an artist who struggles with getting painting time in or feels like you're always busy but never really moving forward with your art, then my workshops just might interest you. Past workshops include Mindset Mastery, a five-week online workshop to help you get past the roadblocks that keep you from painting. In it, we tackle the inner critic, fears of artists, and setting yourself up for a successful creative day. The workshop, How to Develop a Relationship with the Right Gallery, helped several artists find the right gallery and show their work. So if this is something that interests you, you can go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash workshop and get on the email list. This is separate from the main list that tells you when a new episode comes out. This is just for the workshop. So you don't get quite as many emails, but when you do, there's always something really good happening. Sign up now and get a downloadable PDF with case studies that tell you exactly how three artists pushed through barriers that were getting in the way of their studio time. You can, for example, learn how Rhonda went from not wanting to call herself an artist to getting her very first solo show. Also, listen to an introverted artist describe how she built her confidence and then spoke in front of an audience of her peers. And you can discover the tools that Samantha used to take back her power after a decade of believing that she had no, I'm putting air quotes there, she had no talent. So again, go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash workshop to reserve your place on the list. 
When you sign up, you get that downloadable case studies that I mentioned, but more importantly, you get exclusive invites to upcoming workshops. Most of the time when I launch a new program, it sells out before I ever announce it publicly. So reserve your spot now at SavvyPainter.com forward slash workshop. Until next week, this is Antrice Wood with the Savvy Painter podcast. Thank you so much for listening. 